Welcome, everyone, to another edition of 45 Forward, where our mission is to help you, our listeners, from Los Angeles to Long Island, make your second half of life even better than the first. Taking care of an elderly loved one, or yourself for that matter, can be a complicated challenge. Analyzing the medical options of the healthcare maze on top of elder law and estate planning can be confusing and frustrating, even frightening. What's clear is that to successfully navigate this stretch of life's journey, families need a team, a team of advocates to help guide them. In today's episode, two top experts, Dr. Georgian Bartarella, the president and founder of Patient Advocacy MD in suburban Cleveland, Ohio, and Ronald Fatula, the president and founder of Ronald Fatula & Associates in New York, talk about how they advocate for families, each with a unique set of skills, knowledge, and experience in their respective fields. Georgiana will describe how she and her team bring together families, social workers, and doctors to communicate effectively about diagnosis, treatments, and alternatives for care. For his part, Ron will talk about how he works with an array of experts to help guide families through sometimes difficult conversations to meet the needs of their elderly loved ones, whether they need immediate assistance to face a sudden long-term care crisis, or understand the nuances of new laws affecting seniors, or are looking to create an estate plan for future generations. Both Georgian and Ron are steadfastly committed to educating, advocating, and empowering people to chart their own path to health, well-being, and financial stability. Their goal is not only to improve the lives of their patients and clients, but the lives of all seniors to be their voice when people may not be able to advocate for themselves. So now let's meet our guests, Ron Fatula and Georgian Vardarella. Ron and Georgian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Yes. From one Ron to another. Right, Ron <laughs> to another. Uh, now, Ron is actually uh, a repeat guest. Uh, I'll talk about that later when you can listen to one of his previous shows. I'll tell you how I can do that. But uh, before we start talking with each of your um, you know, per, uh, particular ex areas of expertise, I want to just, just for our guests, uh, just tell us a little bit about your career path. You, you, know, you've got, you both have really interesting paths, and, and you've become the founder and principal of your own practices. So just, Georgian, starting with you, just tell, you know, I, I find people who enter these fields to have always interesting evolutionary paths to where they are now. Let's start with you. Yeah, I, I got my medical degree from Georgetown University, uh, finished my residency in internal medicine at University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Hospital, and um, moved here back to my hometown, practiced medicine, uh, primary care, private practice in Northeast Ohio. And I loved what I did. Um, felt very privileged to do what I did. Uh, at the time, the healthcare system was changing. It needed to change. It was not sustainable and it wasn't uh, fully standardized. So around that time, I started considering a lot of different options, whether I would move into more administrative roles or even clinical roles within a larger system. Um, and uh, those are important and terrific jobs. But for me personally, I felt it distanced me from my patients. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really loved the most, the bond between my patients and families. And at the time that I was looking at all of this, concierge care was something that uh, the demographic wasn't right here, but also... I want to take care of a of a, a diverse population of people, and that right. was very limited at the time. Right. Um, I got into writing because a terrific and brilliant guy in Florida, who remains my friend, was an editor uh, for magazines and newspapers, right. and he gave me a job. Okay. And uh, I wrote about a lot of stuff: medical stuff, travel, food, culture, architecture. Um, and I was mulling over the options when I, both my parents had very difficult, very, very long bouts with um, terminal illnesses, right. really tough, tough journeys. And by the time I followed my mom through him, her end of life journey, I, I saw how fragmented and broken mm -hmm. the healthcare system was. So that brought me full circle and I was going to focus my experience and my expertise and my training and my knowledge about the way the system works 
full time on patient advocacy, and I right. founded Patient Advocacy MD. Right, great, great. And how about you, Ron? Well, I, I've had an interesting past. I think, uh, you know, I, I went to uh, when I went to college, I uh, majored in sociology, which actually I loved. It's almost like social work, but for the masses, you know, on a, on a more global scale. Uh, and uh, I always wanted to help people and I wanted to go to social work school, which I did. I went to the Heller School uh, for Social Work at Brandeis mm -hmm. and I enjoyed it, but I always had tugging on me quite a bit was the legal side. And so I wanted to do that as well. So I went to law school as mm -hmm. well and uh, which I loved. <clears throat> and uh, out of law school, I just got some uh, internships, doing some litigation, just to, to feel out the law profession. Right. Uh, and uh, I think you know, Ron, that I have such a big passion for music. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, at one point, I started to look for a job for with a music uh, company or a record company, which I did get. And I wound up being general counsel to Springboard Apex Records that had a very large, at the time, uh, jazz line mm -hmm. called Catalyst and uh, over a thousand employees. And it, it was it was wonderful. Uh, but what I found was I love music, but I didn't like music law, which <laughs> is very, very different. Uh, and uh, so I started a general practice. And I started gravitating and started to help uh, seniors. Started doing a general practice, real estate and this and that. But after a few years, uh, I got calls to do wills and trusts. And at one point, uh, I started to help individuals go on long-term care. And uh, the word got around and uh, uh, some people started calling me the poverty lawyer. <laughs> because I would I would get them poor so they could go on on public benefits. So there I was, the poverty lawyer. I really didn't like that that title, uh, which was changed quite a quite a few years ago to elder law, which I like much better. Right. And uh, <laughs> uh, and I've been doing that for about forty years. I, it's very hard uh, to believe, but I I've been doing elder law work and estate planning for about 40 years. And it's so interesting that the work that I do is truly a combination between the law and social work. Right. And when I sit down with a client, I have to be a psychologist and a social worker, but also a great attorney as well. So I love what I do. It strikes a chord with all of the needs that I, I really wanted to, to work with, you know, right. going, you know, at that time going forward. Yeah. And 40 years later, I still feel the same way. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I just think it's important. I, I think I have uh, guests who have tremendous expertise, but you also have fascinating lives. And it, it for me, it's, I'd like to encourage my listeners to, to listen to the stories of people's lives, because I think too often today, especially, you know, you know, for our, our, ourselves when we were younger and other people as our young you know, people in back of us think that they come out of college and it's like, okay, then what am I going to do? You know, it's like, you're going to do a lot of things or you can do a lot of things. And your, your, your life is a combination of, of intention and serendipity <laughs> and just yeah. sit back and enjoy the, the evolution. So um, thanks for telling us those stories. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so now I want to just uh, uh, segue into a little bit more about just some specifics about what it is uh, each of you do. I think so. The, I think people are generally familiar with patient advocacy, but you know, Georgia, and I think you know, give us some more specifics. I know there are, there are lots of different variations on this. Uh, so tell tell us a little bit about the, the practice in general, and then how you focus on things. I think, first of all, you've got to define advocacy, mm -hmm. which is basically activism. And you should look at it in terms of the self-advocate, um, systems advocate, and then a professional private advocate, which is what I do. 
Um, the self-advocate, basically all advocates are facilitating and supporting through various things, communication, resources, education, research, the patient's ability to access quality care and the insurance system to get it paid for and access it in a way that optimizes their outcomes and their experience. And I think patients and families are their own best advocates. Mm -hmm. But when you cannot access the care, when you cannot get it paid for, you can look within the healthcare system and they have navigators. And these navigators provide a very valuable customer service, I think. Okay. And they also have departments within a system. Typically, it can be the healthcare system itself. It can be an employer, an HR that's administering the health benefits. Um, they have navigators. And they also have departments that can support that navigator and advise that navigator right. if something's beyond the scope or training or authority of what they do. Mm -hmm. But it is customer service. Right. And if your problems are complex, then um, you, as I said, you are your own best advocate. And if you and your family haven't been able to navigate that way, you increasingly are uh, turning to a professional private advocate. Right. And I really like to hear your thoughts, Ron, because I think the profession itself is a little bit of the wild west right now mm -hmm. in that you don't have to have a qualification, you can advocate. And I think most advocates do it from the heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think otherwise, but having said that, I think a good rule of thumb when you're trying to figure out, I've got this problem, how do I handle it, is to really look at experts within law and healthcare and insurance. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, Ron, I mean, I can talk about specifically what I do, but right. I mean, would you say that because you are an advocate in elder care? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, it takes a village. Mm -hmm. It's not just the lawyer. Yeah. It's, it really does take a village. And uh, I mean, just, you know, from my legal, you know, a legal perspective, the uh, advocacy work that we do for our clients on an individual basis, and I also do it globally, but on, on an individual basis is so important. I'll give you an example we do quite a bit of Medicaid planning and also Medicaid applications. Now for home care, when we do our applications, we could do it by road and fill out what we need to fill out and give them uh, you know, all those years of statements, et cetera, and, and get a great application in. But we have to be very creative and we have to advocate. And for home care, there's a very fine line. Clients come in, they want the hours. So we advocate for the hours. But if, if we paint a picture of our clients having so many needs, what Medicaid does say, and we have to be very careful, well, this doesn't look like a candidate for home care. We're not gonna give you one hour of home care. Go to a nursing home. But our clients want, want to stay at home. They just want the help. So we advocate for hours, but we have to really figure out how to do that to get what they need, but not go over that boundary where Medicaid might say, no, no, you need to go into a nursing home. So we get together uh, uh, with our whole team of, of mm -hmm. attorneys. We are seven attorneys. We're about a staff of 18 now, but seven attorneys. We get together every week and go over all of these cases so we could be a little more creative on every case than we were the week before. And uh, we just finished a couple of hours uh, today, uh, just a few minutes ago, going through our cases. So we can become more creative. So we can advocate and not just be another firm that just follows, you know, paint by numbers. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it goes. If you really want to do a great job. Right, right. Yeah, it, it is complicated. You know, I, I went through it 
some of this, um, uh, I, I did not have a patient advocate for my mother, you know, but there were, there were four of our sons. <laughs> so we were all trying to advocate together as a family. Uh, and one of my brothers uh, was, uh, is, is now retired, but he was a doctor. So he, he, he was helpful in, in that respect as well. But it's complicated. You know, we, we ended up applying for Medicaid, but it, it was something that was, it would have been difficult by ourselves. You know, it's not, you know, you can look at all the forms, but there are lots of nuances and, and things, as you know, Ron, change. You know, the law changes year by year. So having someone who is, uh, you know, um, adept at knowing what, what changes are coming up or what, what you know, changes in, I know that there have been changes in power of attorney, changes in community Medicaid, a lot of these issues. You really need someone who is really on top of these things. Yeah, it is incredibly complex. Uh, when you just look at the forms, you just say, well, what's the big deal? But if you, the more you know, the more complex it really is. And the nuances, as you said, uh, mean everything. You know, right. clients want hours, they want to be eligible for nursing home care, and it has to be done the right way. And yes, the law might change every year or a couple of times a year, but it's very interesting. Policy changes almost, mm -hmm. I shouldn't say daily, but monthly. Policy changes a little bit, you know, one way, a little bit another way, and you have to be on top of it. And what, what we might do in New York City might be a little bit different than what we do on Long Island because the Medicaid district there might handle things differently. So the nuances are, are really the key to success. Right, right. Um, we just have a couple of minutes before we gonna take a quick break, but what I wanna start talking about is, as part of this, um, is just the whole the theme that crosses both your professions quite a lot, which is just communication, the communication skills you need. And um, so, uh, you know, this is something that I especially, I think I've talked to you before, Georgian, about it, just be, and, and you, Ron, as well, but being able to basically be uh, multilingual, if you will, <laughs> you know, across disciplines. And so that's one thing that I think that, um, uh, Georgian, you, you have an ability to, to, to cross over and talk different languages for, for whether it's medical field, insurance, and, and be able to communicate with uh, attorneys as well. So we're going to actually take the break now. Uh, but when we come back, don't go away, anyone. We'll be talking much more with patient advocate Georgian Vardarella, elder law attorney Ron Fatula. Uh, so we'll be right back uh, and with much more. Welcome back, folks. We're talking with elder law attorney Ron Fatula and patient advocate Georgian Vardarella. Um, now, before the break, uh, we were talking a little bit about um, communication, about how essential this was in, in both of their fields and in their in, you know, interlocking fields as well. So I was just about to ask Georgian about, you know, does she, you know, crosses over lots of different, uh, you know, arenas, um, dealing with uh, families, social workers, doctors, insurance companies. So what is your basic approach to how you bring people together, Georgian? Well, I think the lack of communication is so severe in the healthcare system that if it's not addressed, I think that's what's going to break the system. Hmm. And to bring really what I do as a physician, I can speak the language of the physician. I'm also a patient. I was also a daughter and caregiver. And what I do is bring everybody together in dialogue, whether I'm appealing an insurance denial for something that's medically necessary, whether I'm trying to get coverage for a protocol treatment that's medically necessary, but it's not covered, whether I'm trying to review medical records and diagnosis and treatment so that I can explain it to patients mm -hmm. in a way they understand it if I'm researching something and providing them with information or second opinions, helping caregivers get the support they need. And really working, a lot of what I do now is focusing on elder care and working with uh, elder care attorneys to you know, look at transition placement. Is it the home? 
Is it a nursing home? If it's a nursing home, how can you be ensured it's safe? Care coordination is optimized. Families are informed. Their questions are answered. It all boils down to communication. You've got to get people to talk to each other. And nobody does. Doctors don't talk to doctors. They don't talk to patients. Healthcare teams aren't talking to each other. It seems like the insurance company's not talking to anybody. Um, and, um, you know, this is really the nuts and bolts of what I do is get people to communicate. I um, had a case fairly recently of a woman who had multiple medical problems, um, cancer, depression. She broke her hip and was in um, rehabilitation and nursing uh, in a nursing home. And her family, tremendously supportive um, and educated. She was an active participant in her care, which you've got to be. Um, but she's in the nursing home. Her physicians do not follow her there. Mm -hmm. So you typically, and this is typical, you get assigned a physician who's going to rotate through every month or so, a team that's going to rotate through. And they didn't know her. Wow. And they thought her dwindling was due to her cancer. They said, no more physical therapy. You will go to hospice. And the family said, no, it's her depression. She needs her meds. She needs treatment. And they couldn't, they couldn't speak with the physician. They couldn't go through that hoop. Mm -hmm. They asked me to provide services. And so basically what I did, reviewed the chart, the family was right. Um, what I did is organize a call with her physicians, with the psychiatrist, with her oncologist, and the physicians at the nursing home. And you guys got to get talk together. She got her treatment. Her depression improved. She was able to get physical therapy, and the and she wanted to go home. And the family would then, you know, arrange to get. What kind of support is she going to get there? What's covered? What's not? And so you can see through this whole thing. Right. And I can talk about case after case where right. The, right. the linchpin is communication. Right. Because you've got to come, you've all got to be on the same page and cooperate. And when you do, it really is a ballet. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, so you, you, work on the medical side. And, and I think Ron mm -hmm. also has a very parallel kind of approach. Uh, you've talked, Georgia, to me about, you know, sort of what you call kitchen table talks. And, yes. and Ron has talked about, you know, family conversations, one of his things. And, and, and so on the, even on the, uh, on the family side, I know, Ron, that you've, you know, every family is different. And here's where your social work comes in. <laughs> right? Boy, where, it does it. <laughs> yeah. So talk about that, about your family conversations and how do you work with families to get them on the same page? Because often they're not. Often they're not. And, and it's a couple of different levels. Many times the children are together and the parent is not together. Parent says, oh, I'm fine at home. I had, you know, you and I talk about our parents quite often. My mother thought she did not want anyone in her house, nobody to help her, and she needed help. She, right. she was prone to falling. She broke both hips. She had two hip replacements, two knee replacements, and she didn't want any help. And uh, from the moment that we got her the help, she never fell again for the rest of her life. Wow. And uh, so... The conversation has to be on, on several different levels. But if, if the parent is my client, I want to protect my parent, you know, the parent, let's say mom, and mom needs to have a voice. And using my social work skills, we let mom talk and talk and express and what the fears are. And we listen. And it's a sometimes a gradual approach that we have. It might take several meetings till we get to a certain point where mom would agree. And sometimes she'll say, I don't need a full-time attendant. I said, okay, how about we do it for eight hours a day? Oh my God, no. 
So sometimes we may start with a couple of hours a day and, and see how it is. Uh, if a client, and it's very interesting, a lot of parents uh, would say, I don't want to spend money on myself. I right. don't need it. I want my money for my children. Mm -hmm. And I would say, Mrs. Jones, I do Medicaid work. The government is paying for this. And sometimes that's all they need. They <laughs> say, really? I, I, I don't have to pay for it? I said, absolutely not. And uh, they said, well, okay, let's try it for four hours. And then a, a few weeks later, they're comfortable. You know, if you get the right person. If you don't have the right person as a home health attendant in, in the home, then uh, you just have to very quickly make sure you get somebody else, right. you know, and you can do that even through Medicaid, no mm -hmm. problem. But sometimes we just build it up till we make sure that the individual gets the, the correct amount of care. Right. And uh, then there are issues of communication between the children. Right. Many times they're on very different pages mm -hmm. and we need to bring them together. We don't want the children fighting and that's all mom needs to hear. Right. And then you know, things really don't work out well. So uh, we might have separate meetings, but depending on who our client is, we make sure that our client is protected. Typically, mom is our client, and uh, we impress upon the children how important it is to be on the same page. And then we use a team approach. Georgian, someone like you or a geriatric care manager, uh, and even on the... Uh, financial side. You know, it's the accountant that will provide certain information that we need and the uh, financial advisor, whoever it might be. And sometimes uh, mom may feel so comfortable with a financial advisor. So we bring them into the loop and we have right. the, the conversation. And many times mom won't listen to a child, but will listen to a third party. So we have to figure out who that third party is, if there's a third party, or what child might might this client listen to more than another? Right. Uh, right. So it's a juggling act. Right. And yes, my social work skills come in very handy here. Yeah, it's interesting whether you're on the legal side or on the medical side, like George Ann, You sort of have to be a diagnostic. Uh, that, that, a diagnostics person <laughs> to yes. really look at the situation, and figure out what it needs to get done. Um, yeah. I, I also think you, you have to get everyone. I think everyone should. And when I practiced primary care, I asked young adults, what's your plan? And that is what I call kitchen table talk. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is you have to sit down with your family or a friend that you trust that is going to have your back and represent your best interests mm -hmm. and tell them what if, what if you're looking at serious terminal illnesses? Because sooner or later, you know, something's going to happen to every single one of us. And it's statistically, we dwindle, we don't just go out. And to really have that talk, it is, believe it or not, not anxiety provoking, it's relieving. And tell people what you want and then document it. Go to somebody like Ron, get it documented. And then go to your providers, ask them the same question. Hear what they say. How are they going to support you? Um, I think uh, that's just imperative to move it forward. And also to look at people. I think both in aging and healthcare, we've got to move away from a disease model to a model of wellness. Mm. You got to do a reality check. You got to be safe. Mom's got to be safe. But what have you still got? And what are your values and your goals in addition to what you need? Right, right. Now, George, Ann, you, you said something so interesting. Uh, so many clients walk into my office and they're literally shaking with fear. Mm -hmm. I guess just confronting the situation mm -hmm. makes them very nervous. And invariably, in, in every single time, at the end of the consultations, which many times could be two hours or two and a half hours, it's not short. Uh, the client would say, I feel so much better. I feel like 
the world, you know, is just so different. That whole, the burden on my shoulder is lifted. I feel great. Thank you so much. I get hugs, which I enjoy. And, and uh, you know, client just knows that this is a process. We're just helping them for the future. Uh, yeah. And it doesn't have to be so burdensome emotionally right now, yeah. uh, depending on what they're going through. But right. even if they're going through a lot or they're just doing planning for the future, they do feel better when they walk out of our office. And I venture to say that after you do your job, they must feel a lot better as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, even personally, you plan that burden is gone. I think too often I see scrambling at the very end. You know, I will get a client and the family's crisis managing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's because there was no plan. And, uh, you know, I think one focus that really, really needs it's misunderstood, it's undervalued, it's underutilized is palliative care, mm -hmm. but it is. And I think communities need to know about it. Everyone needs to know about it. And even providers need to really, you know, if you ask a doctor or nurse, they know what it is. But what I see way too often is that it isn't implemented. And by the time anybody says, oh, palliation, it's really time for hospice. And to really dispel the myth of palliation is a real key piece to all this as well. Could you elaborate a little bit on that, um, Georgia? And just, you know, sure. uh, I'm going to get back to Ron in a second, but just um, what, 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 you know, what we're talking briefly, about. Palliative care is human care. Mm -hmm. It is the care you need when you have a serious chronic illness or a terminal illness. And we need to raise awareness because the World Health Organization said, I think in 2020 or something like that, that palliation not only has patients and families, and, but also caregivers live a more quality of life. Okay. And with palliation, you have physicians who are and nurses specializing in it. And it doesn't mean, I think the perception is it means we're done with you, you're warehoused, it's over. Mm -hmm. It's not what it means at all. It means that support system to look at what your goals are, what your values are, what's your day-to-day -day quality of life. What do you still want to do with your life while you're still getting ongoing treatment that may improve your serious illness, or even affect a cure. And you can come in and out of palliative care. And um, a lot of the focus of what I do now, because I see it over and over and over, somebody gets diagnosed with a cancer or a serious illness, the plans aren't in place. No one talks to them about palliation until it's too late and you're crisis managing. That's not what you want to do. Right. You want to transition in steps. Right. Yeah, I think that, you know, similarly with Ron, I think that, you know, he talks, you talk quite a bit about planning. And I think it's mm -hmm. a planning process that doesn't happen mainly because of fear, right? You're not sure what's coming down and people are fearful of it. So they avoid it until, as you point out, once they get into it, having the knowledge, you know, is, it's not necessarily, you're not comfortable, but there is a comfort in knowing what your choices are. And I think going back to a little bit to the communication thing, when I've, uh, I've heard you speak quite often, Ron, about, and, and it's just, it's a matter of plain speaking and, you know, straight talk, but plain speaking with your clientele so that they, you know, they, they feel a certain comfort. They, they know what you're saying. You're not, you know, burying them in jargon. And I think that's important. It is very important. And, and it's interesting. Lawyers tend to use quite a bit of jargon. Uh, sometimes I, I find myself drifting in that direction mm -hmm. and I immediately it's easy. go yeah. back. And yeah, but there is an art to being able to communicate, uh, you know, these sometimes very complex legalities in plain talk. Uh, but one way to do it is through a story. You know, if, if you do X, this is what you know, the result will be. If you do Y, this is what the result will be. And so 
we do it a lot through stories. We go through their individual situation. But again, plain talk is very important so that they understand what's going on. Right, and, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Good. good. So I just want to, you know, talk a little bit about some, some more specifics um, just to give people an idea of, uh, uh, you know, you, do, you guys do a lot of different things, but just a few examples of the kinds of specific things you do to work with patients and clients. Um, so I know with, with you, Georgian, I mean, you, you assist patients in transitioning from hospitals to home, um, but helping them understand medications, but give me a little bit more about, you know, what are the specific things that, that, that you can provide for patients? You know, I think it's different depending on the situation. As mm -hmm. I said, I can um, appeal a denial for care that is uh, is medically necessary. Mm -hmm. A quick example, an employer called me. A young man had an unfortunate injury, uh, spinal cord injury, and was paralyzed mm -hmm. and uh, was in a rural nursing home. And uh, the insurance said, well, he's getting the same care he would get in what just briefly, uh, what a young person like that needs is something called translational rehab. Mm -hmm. There's only maybe five centers in the country that do that cutting edge treatment, peer, being with your peers, learning how to live your life, uh, have a life, have work. Um, and I, the employer said, can you reverse this denial? Uh, I did. I called the physician who, uh, um, uh, in the insurance company who initially did deny it on the grounds that he was receiving the same care in a rural nursing home. The physician there was great, tried to do it, just didn't have time. Um, and the nursing home really treated hips and elderly strokes, not a place for this young man. Mm -hmm. And I just pointed out the cost, uh, long-term cost of not only the value of this man's life, but, but um, you know, the, the business cost, it's gonna cost you more money. He's gonna get mm -hmm. in the fact that he's gonna be bedridden, he's never gonna work and on and on and, and all the complications and really provided the medical literature that this is best practices and we got him moved in three hours. Right. So I also look at protocol treatments that aren't covered. Are they mm -hmm. medically necessary if you've failed treatment? I, I give support to caregivers in that I can go with their loved one to their appointments. I can help you form questions before you get there. Right. So your time is better spent. Um, and I touched upon nursing home. I like to do that with elder care lawyers, because it's just a more complete package uh, in elder care, um, but not always. Um, and, you know, when you're talking about medications, it's really reviewing the medical chart and treatment and diagnoses in terms of a way they can understand. I right. do not do that without their physicians and team on board. Right. I don't practice medicine. I don't take it upon myself to, you know, it, it really is, I'm the bridge. I'm the one that makes everybody's job facilitated and move forward. I'm right. not there for any other reason than that right. to get the best outcome and experience. Right. Right. And Ron, on your behalf, I mean, I know that, you know, you work with a lot, you know, with advanced directives and Medicaid planning, estate planning, guardianships, a couple of areas that, you know, seem to be that where, I mean, people think they can do things by themselves, like advanced directives. And that's one area where I know that you've done a lot of work, as well as guardianships. Perhaps you can talk about a couple of those. Sure, absolutely. You know, I have so many clients and I ask, well, do you, do you have documentation for me to look at? So in the in the initial consultation, we of course get a sense as to the family, what documents they have, what sort of planning needs to be done. And what's so interesting about elder law is that it encompasses so many disciplines. Uh, it, it is the documentation. Mm -hmm. It's estate work. It's estate tax planning. Uh, it's... Uh, it's the guardianships, it's Medicaid planning, uh, it's probate if an individual passes away. 
real estate if they have real estate, because we have to handle that mm -hmm. as they get older. It could be their business that needs to be transferred, uh, you know, for estate planning purposes or because they can't can no longer uh, operate in the business. So there are so many disciplines that elder law covers, uh, which is which makes it very complex, but which is why I love it so much. I don't get bored, you know, right. and it, it's wonderful. So for example, with advanced directives, right. client might say, oh, I have a power of attorney. I don't need one. And we look at the power of attorney and it doesn't provide for Medicaid planning, doesn't pro provide for estate tax planning. Uh, there's no gifts allowed. It doesn't have all of the provisions that could protect a home, for example, uh, from Medicaid. And the list goes just on and on right. and on. And uh, people think they have a form and they have a good power of attorney. And so many times we have to go in for a guardianship action because they thought they had a power of attorney, which they did, but it wasn't good enough. It didn't do what they wanted it to do. So this is a funny area of law. It looks simple, but it is far from simple. And we have to look at it as, as a very holistic approach because everything goes together. When we do a trust, mm -hmm. well, we do a different type of power of attorney. The agent on the power of attorney has certain rights vis-a-vis -vis that trust, and it all has to work together. People just don't realize how it's like the, the gears of a, a watch or a clock, or as, as they used to be in the mm -hmm. old days, right. uh, You know that, that has to work together. So all of the documents that we do and the planning we do just basically gets done a certain way, depending on that individual's needs and what goals we're really striving for. Right, right. Yeah, these things, you can get templates off the internet, <laughs> but that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a template. And, uh, you know, and it, I think that's the trap that you think it's going to cover things and, and you don't even, you, there are questions you just don't know what to ask, you know, and I think right. that's what both of you do is, is you, you help people not only uh, what the answers, but figuring out the right questions to ask before you get the answers. Um, right. So yeah. I'm gonna we're gonna take another quick break. Uh, when we come back, don't go away anywhere. But there's a lot more that we're gonna we're gonna talk about in our last segment with Ron Vatul and George Ann Vardarella. Um, uh, it's gonna be a very quick break, so don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back. Welcome back, folks. We're talking with Ron Fatula and George Ann Vardarella about advocacy, uh, both patient advocacy from a medical perspective as well as legal advocacy. So um, I want to just, in our last segment, talk about, and we've talked a lot about personal advocacy. Um, and uh, But you folks, what I like about you is you really step out broadly and support seniors broadly and advocate on the behalf of of uh, seniors, whatever age the senior is, I don't know. I'm not even sure what what uh, that, that word means anymore. But 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 talk about uh, Georgia, and let's start with you a little bit about um, some of your speaking engagements and advocacy. I know you did uh, something called Positively Senior, mm -hmm. um, and and then you've also worked uh, with um, you know with um, uh, uh, you know palliative care issues as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I had done a a lot of public speaking initially, um, you know, I had taught and spoke then, but I, I started to publicly speak about wellness and aging. Uh, the mayor and city council of a local suburb, mm -hmm. suburban, large suburban community here, um, asked me to speak to their constituents about the need to tear down their old hospital institution and put in a state-of-the-art Mm -hmm. medical center and it was a bone of of real uh emotion because this was a historic uh, hospital it had a lot of history it had a lot of community ties and where uh, i had to get the public was to really look to their future and what was in their best interest mm -hmm. and for their own wellness and while I was doing that, I got involved in their Commission on Aging, and um, it started to galvanize my thinking about aging and how we perceive seniors, how marginalized we are, and mm -hmm. how trivialized and dismissed. And I mean, 
oh my, you know, and that we are thought of as a burden, which is definitely false. We are drivers, key drivers in the economy. And um, I started thinking, my gosh, this is a colossal waste of talent. It's a waste of money. It's a brain drain. It's an economic drain. And I, I, I formed a nonprofit, Positively Senior, and very briefly, there was a brilliant young woman I worked with, incredibly creative. Um, she was the director of an assisted living. And these people were moderate to low income. They were, um, many of them had mental and physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I always look at not what you lost, but what have you got? Mm -hmm. And so the two of us came up with, we had a chef kitchen in a community center. And what, as the social services in the community were drying up and going away, you couldn't fund programs they needed. How can they um, uh, uh, contribute to these programs and plow that money back in to keeping these programs up and alive? And so the two of us came up with, how about if all these residents make dog treats? And I got it through the various licensing things you've got to do in Ohio, made sure, uh, Ron, you would appreciate it. All the legal I's were dotted and T's were crossed. And we did start to do that. I actually got a national pet chain interested. And the young woman who was helping me get off this ground at the ground, who was really in charge of the funding went on a dating app, met a guy, moved somewhere out west, and the, the program collapsed. It's not dead. Um, I am always willing and ready to resurrect it. Um, but she was such an important part. We didn't get it quite off the ground in the way that, um, you know, we, we lost our funding. Um, okay. Well, let, but let me uh, just uh, because we we have a not too much time. If I wanted to get Ron yeah. in here a little bit to give yeah, you, yeah. Uh, give a sense of some of the things you've worked on, I know you've been very active with ARP, the Alzheimer's Association, but also in terms of advocating. You know, I know that you've worked a lot with guardianship issues across with working did, with lawmakers. I did. You know, it, it started many years ago, and uh, with the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, I chaired their public policy. Uh, a committee for, I'd say maybe five, six years, maybe seven, I'm not sure. And uh, part of what I was very proud of, uh, we actually developed a plan to pay for long-term care, almost like Medicare for all for long-term care. Right. And we thought we figured it out. And there was a funding policy, you know, where uh, it would take about 15 years to get to a point where this would happen. But every year we were getting closer to it. And I was fortunate enough to meet with President Clinton while he was president. Uh, I went to the White House and I went through the plan with him. And it was just amazing uh, being there. He was a very sharp guy, whether or not you like his politics. Very, very sharp. Loved the idea. It was not a great time politically, he said, for it. But uh, this was something that uh, was definitely going to be on his back burner. Nothing ever came of it. I wish it, it did. But it started then uh, with the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. I worked very hard on that and really enjoyed it. I brought the Uniform Adult Guardianship Act to New York State, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, helps with, I don't know if any listeners uh, or, or viewers heard of granny snatching, where mm -hmm. it might be a family member or a third party would take a senior and take them to another state for various psychological and other sorts of reasons. None of them usually very good at all. Uh, but this is a way to, to cut so much of the red tape out of that situation. And uh, that was signed by Governor Cuomo just a couple of years ago. And there's a new Article 83 in the law. And uh, I was also a part of the Executive Council for AARP for five years, uh, where most of what we did was going through legislation and speaking with legislators, going to Washington, Albany, and New York, uh, and trying to make a difference on, on many, many of these proposed uh, 
legislation uh, initiatives. Right. So uh, and that's just part of it. Even yeah. in the last New York State budget, there was a lot of work that I did. Great. Great. Yeah, yeah. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our show. It's the time always goes swiftly. Uh, I just wanted to spend a couple uh, minutes just thanking you for a terrific conversation. I really appreciate your participation, your information, and your passion. Um, once again, folks, um, uh, if if you can tell your friends if you missed my conversation with Georgian and Ron today, you can listen to it as a podcast on voiceamerica.com, just search for my show 45 Forward, or go to my website, roelresources.com, and click 45 Forward, and you can hear it there as well. Um, so uh, be sure to join me next Monday, 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern time, when I'll be talking with Roberta Israeloff, a former classmate of mine, and George McDermott, one of our former English teachers. Uh, it's, it'll be an interesting program. You know, Roberta and George reconnected years later, ended up writing a fascinating book, about their lifetime experiences in education, how things have gone, have changed, right and wrong, and what endures today. It's part one of a unique three-part summer series I'll be doing this June, July, and August. So folks, until then, keep moving forward, 45 forward.